All right. And don't forget to hit record, Daniel. I just did. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go live in five, four, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. We are just allowing a few more people to trickle in, and we are also waiting for our chief of police. So once he logs on, we will get going with the town hall. Chief. Hey, Supervisor, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. I'm going to put on a tie here real quick. Okay, so. So we're live. So everyone's okay. okay. <laughs> Let me uh, put my tie on, so I'm sorry. That's I was okay. just jumping off another meeting. We understand. <clears throat> Okay, sorry right. about that. Thank you. So hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Supervisor Catherine Stephanie and I'm really pleased to be partnering with our police chief, Bill Scott, to host this virtual town hall. We received over 1000 registrations and hundreds of questions. So we'll not be able to get to each question specifically, but I know we'll be discussing topics that were broadly representative of what everyone submitted. And also if there are specific outstanding questions after this event, my office will reach out individually and you can always call us at 415-554-7752 or email us at stephaniestaff at sfgov.org. So we are all here for obvious reasons tonight. And since we've been sheltering in place and contending with COVID-19, we have seen a huge spike in residential burglaries We've heard about an increase in gang and gun related crimes. And we've heard about many other disturbing incidents that really are driving families out of San Francisco. I hear it all the time. One of the primary responsibilities, and I always say this, of local government is public safety, is to keep people safe, to provide a peace of mind. And clearly that is not happening right now. The status quo policies that have allowed bad behavior to go unchecked cannot remain in place. As one of 11 supervisors, I alone cannot enact all the policies that I would like to see, but here's where I would start. Taking burglaries and gun cases seriously, bringing more lawsuits against known drug dealers like those the city attorney announced earlier this year, ensuring the availability of recovery services and stable housing for individuals suffering from addiction and using our conservatorship laws and expanding access to mental health beds. I want to mention that uh, while the police are a big part of keeping our neighborhood safe, the district attorney has an important role as well. I'm working to make him our next town hall guest so that I can ask him the questions many of you have shared with me. So I want to make sure we leave enough time to get to all the questions. So if I'll turn it back over to Chief Scott to introduce himself along with Captains um, Conley and Yep. So brief introduction so we can get into those questions. Thank, thank you, Supervisor Stephanie. Um, so I have, with, I have with me tonight, Captain Paul Yep. He's the district captain of our Northern District Station. And I have acting captain William Connolly or Bill Connolly, who is our district uh, acting captain at our Richmond District Station. And they bring with them a ton of experience and energy. And I know as Supervisor Stephanie uh, pointed out, we have some challenges right now in our city, particularly with burglaries and property crime. And um, there's a lot to talk about and we hope to walk away with this or from this, at least from our perspective, uh, with you equipped with a little bit more information of what's happening, uh, what we're trying to do to, to make this situation better, uh, what we plan to do in the future as an ongoing strategy to make this situation better. And then um, as the supervisor, you know, this is a team effort in my opinion. And, you know, we have a job to do, but we need your support, of course, and we definitely need to partner with our district attorney's office. So when we do uh, have a person that we get into custody, um, there needs to be accountability there. And so all those things are in place, but I think we have a lot of improvement to do so we can make this situation better. 
So I'll, I'll stop there for now and turn it back over to Supervisor Stephanie, and then uh, we'll get go along with the uh, town hall. Yeah, thank you, Chief Scott. And as you said, you know, we, we're not talking about anecdotal evidence here. We're talking about actual crime statistics. And what I'm seeing, I get them every day. I get them weekly summaries. And we know that residential burglaries are up so high in District 2. And one of the questions that um, came up from Patricia Calhalla was, first, what are the factors causing an increase in crime in our neighborhood? And what types of crimes are increasing? What time of day and night are most crimes committed? I'll, I'll take uh, that question and, and I'll, I will ask uh, both captains to, to weigh in. I'll give you a citywide perspective. And one of the things that we have seen citywide is that burglaries are up citywide. We're up 46%, which represents uh, many hundred burglaries over this time last year. Uh, it's a significant increase. And we've seen some other areas, crime categories go down. Car break-ins are down, uh, theft in general is down but burglaries are up, robberies are down, burglaries are up. Now one theory, and this is, this, is, this is anecdotal because we had not been able to prove this enough to say that it's a certainty, but one theory is that because those other categories are down, the, the crime of choice right now is burglaries. You know, most of our, our residential burglaries are garage burglaries where we're seeing bicycles, tools, hand tools, items like that that have a lot of resale value on the street. That's what's being taken. Um, disturbingly and, and, and sadly, oftentimes when these garage burglaries happen, the residents, the people are at home, which really takes that to a different level. Um, you know, burglaries are bad enough, but to have it happen when you're at home is really, really frightening and disturbing. So that's, that's something that we really want to get our arms wrapped around. Now, in, in supervising your district, it, there's no exception. Burglaries are up significantly. And we do believe because of what we know to be true uh, with individuals that we have identified that there are some very prolific burglars out there that have victimized residents of the city and in the region repeatedly. And a lot of, a lot of times we know this because we catch them and we see their, their extensive uh, criminal histories. And we've actually been able to tie many of them to several burglaries. So we know that's a factor. And one of our strategies on that is we've identified the, these individuals and we have a list of, of, we have a list of 30 that are very prolific and, and we are seeking to take them off the streets and so they can be held to account for these, these crimes. We also have uncovered some fencing operations where they're taking this property and they're selling it to fences and it ends up on uh, the social media sites that on the internet and people are buying it from Craigslist and, you know, through Amazon and the like. So that that's an issue for us too. And we have made some headway on, on that. We've just made some significant arrests in the last month on those type of operations, which feed this, this crime. Um, so with that, um, in short, Anecdotally, we think that it's just the crime of choice right now because these other crimes, there's less people out with the shelter in place orders. So robberies are down, there's less tourists in the city. So the car break-ins are down, but people that do this for a living are gonna find a way to, to steal for a living. And so they're breaking into garages. Uh, there's a you know, population of these individuals that, that are, uh, that are uh, unsheltered or, or, or unhoused. I wouldn't say that's a big number, but there are some. And then there's the, the, the drug addiction component. You know, many of them have criminal histories that include your drug arrest and that and the like. And, and we know that can fuel this as well. So I think those factors, those confluence of factors are the reason that you see a spike. So I, I'd like to, if you would allow me supervisor to turn it over to both captains to talk specifically about their districts. Great, thank you, Chief Scott. Yes, because I know you said 40% for burglaries citywide, but I know it's much higher in District 2, so. Right. So, uh, Paul, if you would go first. Absolutely, so thanks, Chief. Um, first, I would acknowledge um, Supervisor Stephanie's support and uh, her communication with Northern Station. Thank you very much for that. And of course, Chief Scott's support also um, to helping Northern Station with mitigating crime. So first let me acknowledge that we know that there is a burglary problem in the Northern District. And 
Um, to the supervisor's point, it is in fact uh, worse in the northern than citywide. It's 69% uh, from my latest statistics. So one, I want to acknowledge the problem. And, uh, but two, I, I do want to um, talk about a little bit of good news. And I think little wins are important. Um, one, I've been at Northern Station for approximately six months and I've challenged the entire station to put an end to these burglaries. We're very late into the year. So we're not going to be able to change that percentage much, but um, I would just want to share a little bit of good news is that I've been tracking the weekly burglary uh, statistics for the district, uh, both commercial and residential. And as of August, uh, there's been a slow uh, stop of the increase and slow decreases in burglary. So I know that we have a lot of work to do and this is not a win. We, uh, we need to double our efforts on this, but I'll just give you an example from the week of uh, August 31st to September 6th. Burglaries, commercial and residential were down 14%. The following week from September 14th to the 20th, they were down 22%. Unfortunately, from September 28th to October 4th, they were up 30%, but then the trend down continues after that. Um, and let me just give you that. So for instance, on uh, November 9th through November 15th of this year, they were down 43%. So we're slowly mitigating the crime. A lot of it is um, the challenge that we put out to the officers to stop this by making arrests and by enforcement actions, but also through the supervisor's office, through education, uh, your efforts in the community to prevent this by calling this in, alerting us so that we can look at trends and um, some environmental changes that you've made that we've asked you to make, like securing your garages, uh, you know, uh, doubling down on your locks, um, you know, installing lighting systems, camera systems, things like that. So uh, we'll talk, I'm sure we're gonna talk more about burglary. So I'll go ahead and turn this over to uh, Captain Conley. Thanks, Paul. Um, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna first uh, thank you for, for having me here today to this, to the meeting, to this meeting. It's important, um, you know, um, Su Supervisor Stephanie has been extremely supportive of the work that we do uh, as um, is the chief also, which uh, I appreciate and makes my job easier at Richmond. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, when I think about this, you know, and I have, and I do have numbers, um, th there, there, burglary is the number one crime that occurs in the Richmond as well. Um, we've seen a decrease um, in the auto burglaries that were once quite high. Um, but as a result of um, some changes, some environmental changes, I think with COVID, we can't deny that COVID has had an effect on a lot of the, um, the issues that are going on in San Francisco in terms of um, crime, people's ability to maintain housing. There's a lot of things that, that work into this. And, and people are seeing things in their districts, including the Richmond, I'm sure Paul can concur with this in the Northern, that they're not used to seeing, you know? Um, <clears throat> for, you know, just on a side note, I grew up in the marina I'm a, I'm, a marine, I'm a marina kid. I went to Sh Sherman Elementary and I read through a lot of these questions and the concerns. And, you know, um, my mom used to sh shop at Marina Super and I and I, I could get if I lived there, people were thinking like, what is going on? You know, um, but what's going on is we're in a really unique time right now. And uh, something definitely my 26 years in the police department, I, I haven't seen before. Um, we've uh, crime has a tendency. It, uh, it, it ebbs and flows. But um, I think with this particular pandemic, we've been, you know, we've been challenged. Um, I can tell you that at Richmond, and I know at Northern too, because I know they have an excellent play and close team over there, which I've um, seen. Um, you know, our job as a district captain is to, you know, captains to push back against that, and um, you know, utilize, come up with plans, motivate our officers, um, and look at trends. Um, as Paul was just describing. I can tell you in the Richmond, for example, I'll throw out some numbers, just give you an idea. And these are year to date numbers. Um, you know, burglaries year to date in our district um, are at 549. Commercial, um, commercial burglaries as a portion of that are 188. And residential burglaries year to date um, are 361. Um, <clears throat> I, I, as you know, I too, as well as Paul, have been empowering the officers to get out there and make it our top 
mission to stop these burglars. In my mind, in my mind, one burglar is one too many. And I want to make sure that we we hold the people that are doing this accountable. One of the things that has come up in other meetings um, and concern is when people are seeing crimes increase in a way that they haven't seen before. Um, we're seeing, you know, again, burglaries is, is, is one of the segments of, of crime that has increased. People, you know, begin to, you know, ask questions like, who's coming in here and doing all these? Um, you know, our experience, and I think the chief would back me on this also, is that, you know, it's not a hundred different people coming into the Richmond or to the Northern and committing these crimes. It's um, a very focused group of individuals who have uh, sensed the environmental changes that are going on across the city, and uh, they're taking advantage of that. And uh, we're, you know, at the same time as the police department, we're trying to arrest those individuals because it is a very, it's a much smaller and focused group. Um, and we're trying to arrest those individuals and hold them accountable. And what I, what I found in many of the districts that I've worked in in the past is that when you, when you arrest that individual and they are held accountable, they're, you know, they're put in prison or they're put in jail, um, or they're held accountable through the legal system, that those particular statistics start to drop. So that's really the ultimate goal. And that's the goal that I, that I have in, in the Richmond. Um, we are, um, I'll just throw it out there, um, you know, a few of the things that we have been doing is we're running um, plainclothes um, enforcement operations. We have, um, I've been putting officers who are uniformed and unmarked vehicles to increase our ability to surveil areas. Um, we have, um, you know, as the chief mentioned, this is a team approach. I encourage citizens to take videos, take pictures, send them to us and our investigators so we can work together because it is a team effort. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, police enforcement is one half of it. The other half of it is we have more eyes of, you know, there's more people in the community than are, there are police officers. So the more eyes we have out there, uh, you know, look, you know, looking after their neighborhoods, being proactive about uh, safety precautions, whether it be cameras, lighting, um, uh, you know, uh, making police reports that so we're documenting things so we can follow up and, and, and communicate together as a community. Um, those are the things that are going to get us, th get us to success. And so those are the things that we're doing right now. And, um, um, and I believe with all my heart that we are going to, we're going to prevail. We're just going to keep pushing at it. It's like, you know, a dam, you've got lots of holes, you put your fingers in the holes and we're going to plug each hole that comes up as it comes and, and, uh, and, and overcome this. So. Great. Thank you. Um, yes. I mean, we have a lot of other issues to cover, but residential burglaries, hot prowl burglaries is when you're home, they're called. Um, that is just such a big topic. We had so many stories come in. Like Alex from Cal Hollow talked about a man trying to break into her four-year-old son's room in her fourth floor apartment last month. Um, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, it, it, I think people to want to know exactly what the, you know, what you're doing to try to combat it. And I've heard plainclothes police officers, you mentioned that. It sounds like, you know, what Chief Scott said, you know around 30 individuals that are um, participating in that. You're looking at that. So, um, We'll, I mean, we'll continue to report back on this. It's good to hear, Captain Yep, that some of it's going down. We still know it's way up from last year, but um, that is something, residential burglaries, that um, is on um, the forefront of everyone's mind in District 2. Um, su su see. Supervisor, uh, Stephanie, yep. can I just quickly add a few, few other things? Uh, just to, you asked, and it's really important for people to know what, what we're doing. Right. Uh, to hold us to account if you don't see these things out there. You know, we have increased our foot beats now um, in, in specific areas where those burgers are, are occurring. Uh, some of the specific areas we've, we've posted fixed post officers. Um, we've supported the district stations with specialized units such as our Hondas or our Solo, depending on what the, what the problems are. And you know, Captain Connolly mentioned that the plain clothes efforts um, you know, we're, we're, we're putting a lot of resources on this and the visibility helps as well. When, when people see patrol cars in their neighborhoods, when they see the officers either on foot or fixed posts in their neighborhoods, that helps as well. But that still has not been enough. So a, a combination of the visibility, the higher presence and patrol, and really trying to focus in on those people that we think are doing the most uh, negative impact, the, the prolific, hopefully will bring 
these burglaries down because we, we do know that some of these folks are involved in, they, they are very prolific. Right. And those are the ones that we're really concerned about and the ones that are brazen enough to go in somebody's house uh, when they're at home are the ones that we really want to take, take off the street. So one of the things that we are seeing that some of these are, are organized crews, so we're working them as such. And so we have, in some cases, our, our GTF officers assisting in the investigation, our gang task force. And in other situations, we have our, our um, you know, these people have criminal history sometimes that be, go beyond burglaries. So if they, if they have been doing car break-ins and robberies, we bring those investigative specialties in because if we can hold them to account for another crime other than burglary, but get them off the streets, we're fine with that. So we're looking at it from all angles. Great, thank you for that. And I also wanna to add too that Captain Yep and I have been meeting with various pockets of neighborhoods uh, where this is occurring um, at a very high rate. So we are available to do that, to meet with neighbors and talk about how to keep that area, um, that specific area safe. So please um, reach out to us if you want us to do that with you. But it's, I think it's been effective with the groups that we have met with. Um, it also, uh, I've secured lighting for um, Lafayette Park, that was a big issue. And I'm looking at making sure the lighting in, in more places, you know, is, is up to standards. So if you see an area that you don't think is, please let our office know. Um, with the Palace of Fine Arts, that was the thing where we got security gates. I know that sounds like a little thing, but I know that a lot of people were staging behind there and that's been um, something that's been good. And working on security cameras throughout the district. Um, we know that um, there's someone who's been working on that in the Union Square area. And I think that that could be helpful too for um, preventative measures and then of course for um, solving any crimes. Um, I wanna go quickly now to response times. Um, what is the average response time for San Francisco Police Department to respond to a break-in within the Pacific Heights neighborhood? Um, this person says, I've personally observed two incidents where response time was between seven to 10 minutes, and that's Kyle from Pacific Heights. And I just wanna to add too that on the other end of that, I've heard that the police don't get there in time. And I had a situation with, I called Captain Yep, I think at 10 o'clock at night, or texted and uh, my friend who lives right off Lafayette Park had someone on her doorstep pounding on the door with two big dogs. She was home alone with her kids and her kids were scared and she had called the police and they were on other priority calls. So um, if you can just respond to that because that has that comes up a lot as well. Th thank you, uh, Supervisor Stephanie. Our average response time is between five and six minutes for a priority A call. Now for a priority B, priority C is higher because those are lower priority calls, but it's between five and six minutes. And that's something that we uh, are definitely working on. That it, a lot of things factor into that deployment. It, it, if there's adequate deployment, we have better response times, uh, traffic and other things play into that as well. Because of the shelter in place and COVID, traffic has not been nearly the issue that it normally is. So that uh, our, our response times actually are going down because of that. Um, the, the issue oftentimes is just keeping up with the calls for service. A, a station like Northern, where it's a very busy station in terms of call load, uh, sometimes the calls stack, you know, and you can only handle one call at a time. So we do our best to manage those call loads, but sometimes it just becomes an issue of staffing on a busy day or night where the calls stack up because we just don't have enough officers out in the field. But that average chance your question is between five and six minutes for a priority A call. Okay, and can you, what is a priority A call? Oh, I'm sorry. An example sorry, priority I should have explained that. For people that yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I should have explained That's that. Okay. So our priority A call, our calls are prioritized with the priority A call being the highest priority. So those are the ones that we will dispatch first. And those calls are like crimes in progress, uh, serious crimes, shootings, robberies, a hot file burglary would be a priority A call, um, it, assaults in progress, those type of things. Then we have priority B and priority C. Priority B are calls, let's say a crime occurred, but the individual, the suspect is no longer there. So there will be a response. You wanna get there you know, as quick as you can because you may have a chance of the person leaving the area. Those are gonna be a priority B. 
priority C or the lower priority calls. You come home, your wall has been vandalized. You know, and those calls don't require an immediate response per se. Uh, so those are put on a lower priority. And, you know, the, the response time accordingly increases as you go down the priority list because those low priority calls really stack up. And oftentimes officers get uh, what I call reassigned or retone. If they're going to a lower priority call, they get re re reassigned to a higher priority call. So it pushes that time out even further. But for those uh, the crimes that I mentioned, those crimes in progress, violent crimes in progress, hot prowl burglaries and somebody's at home, uh, those type of things, those are gonna be high priority calls. Okay, thank you for that. And I wanna, I wanna turn now to gun violence. And um, for anybody who knows me knows that this is a huge topic for me. It's something that I've volunteered on for 20 years now. And it's interesting because a lot of my volunteer work didn't really focus on San Francisco because it never seemed, um, I mean, we did a lot in San Francisco in terms of um, gun violence prevention legislation, but recently as the Chronicle reported, we know that shootings are up more than 30% this year. I've been sickened about some of the shootings we've um, heard about the six-year-old little boy who was killed on 4th of July. Um, Courtney Brousseau, who was walking home from Dolores Park and just tweeted out, um, life was good, and which breaks my heart and coach Lamar Williams, it just, I, and there's just so many. And I've, I've called for a budget and legislative analyst report um, on the shooting incidents in San Francisco and to look at five-year trends and in incidents, arrests, charges, and final dispensation of cases. Um, but I think we have to understand how many incidents are left unaddressed in order to fix the system. And I'm also planning on holding a hearing on that final report in January. But there have been shots fired in District 2 more than ever before. I've lived here for 20 years. I have a 15-year-old son who often skateboards. Um, and my 11-year-old my daughter um, who likes to walk the dog. And the shots, the, the reports have been very disturbing. We've had Shots fired at Van Ness and Broadway. Captain Yep and I went to the neighbors there to talk about that and um, Pacific and Webster. One disturbing uh, incident right after election day down my street on Greenwich, cars were drag racing um, very early in the morning and there were five shots that rang out then. Um, and other reports of people being held up at gunpoint in the middle of the day in um, the marina. One of our merchants was robbed at gunpoint. I've known her, I know her well. I, I didn't ask to use her name tonight, so I won't, but um, terrifying. I talked to her as soon as I found out about it. And then we had that film crew um, of five that was held up with a semi-automatic handgun um, and $50,000 of film equipment was stolen. That was in the middle of the day in the marina. and. You know, this shouldn't happen anywhere. And my, but people are very nervous and people are very scared. So Linda from the Marina um, wrote a question, Ryan from the Marina, what is being done about the gunshots being heard around our neighborhoods? Are we getting our police force up to its quota of officers? And what are the specific district level responses to the uptick in brazen gun crimes in the Marina? Yeah. Um... Let me take those questions. I'll start with the, the staffing because that one is probably the quickest that I can answer. So we are not up to our staffing levels or where we should be. We're, um, you know, the resolution, I mean, the, the ordinance just got passed. So our staffing from this point forward will be based on a staffing analysis. So we had that staffing analysis completed this past, this year actually. And what it showed is we were about 265 officers short. Where that hurt the most is in patrol um, because every, every officer counts, and you know, every officer counts anywhere, but in patrol is particularly a, a, an issue. So we, we are short. Um, it's gonna be difficult this, you know, this coming fiscal year because of, you know, the budget situation in the city. We're not gonna grow the department, but thankfully the board of supervisors and the mayor are not cutting the department. Uh, what we will lose is some of our vacant positions. And, you know, there's been some reallocation of funding and, and we all understand that, but we're gonna lose our vacant positions. Uh, 
hopefully at some point we'll be able to build back up, but we're short. We're short about 265 officers. And that translates into both captains having less officers than we would like them to have. And that's across the board. We've had to cut units. We've had to cut some things that we didn't really want to cut, but you know, that's a part of what has to be done. We have to prioritize our, our, our personnel and handle our priorities. Um, so that's the first question uh, answered. As far as the gun violence, just in overall, gun violence is up across the city. Or we have uh, exceeded last year's homicides by five, and we still have two, year, two, two weeks to go. Now, the, if there is a silver lining in what I just said, last year we were at almost a 50 plus year low in homicides. We had 41 last year, which was a 50, I think we hadn't had that since the early 1960s. However, this year, 30 of our 46 homicides are, are firearm related. Um, the gun violence, like Supervisor Stephanie has mentioned, we've seen an uptick in shooting incidents. And thankfully, a lot of them don't result in people getting hit, but they're just as disturbing because we, we just, we've, we've been lucky. We've seen an uptick across the city. Uh, the most disturbing part of this, and you mentioned the type of things that are happening in broad daylight, um, like shootings with assault rifles with, with multiple rounds, not in your district, but in another part of the city recently, a few months ago, where you know, 50, 60 or plus shots were fired and, and in front of a shopping area. So those things you know, have to be brought to an end. The good piece of news on this is that like for that shooting and several others that were like that, we have identified and, and arrested people. A lot of these shootings, particularly what I just described with these shootouts with high power rifles involve ongoing feuds between one group or another group, uh, some of them local, some of them from out of the city. And those, um, if there's any good part to this, they're, they're somewhat easier to predict and somewhat easier to, to solve because when you know that it's involving a group or gang, you usually have clues and you can you know where to deploy to prevent the retaliatory shootings, which your district supervisor, we don't have a lot of those. The random ones are more problematic, particularly the ones that stem from robberies or you know street level crimes, because those are, are random and unpredictable and more problematic. Um, oftentimes we're very fortunate that we have a lot of people and a lot of businesses with camera systems. And many of these crimes are solved because of a piece of evidence, video evidence, where we get a license plate or a vehicle description. And because we're a small city, there's, you know, our officers are really good about knowing their communities and their neighborhoods. And we end up tracking a lot of crimes that way. Um, our solve rates on the actual homicides are, are actually pretty good in terms of a major city. It's about 70%. Uh, and, you know, that includes some prior years homicides, but it's about 70%. So we do pretty good there. Where we, where we have the most challenges are the random middle of the day, a person attempts to do a robbery with, an, with, a, with a firearm, uh, shots fired, and we have to put it together from there. We have solved some, particularly some of the armed robberies. Oftentimes, again, they're groups, they're crews. Many times they're not from the city. Uh, and we've been partnering with the surrounding areas to put our heads together because what we see is oftentimes you have a crew come from, let's say the East Bay, an East Bay city, and they're very well known in that city. They come here because nobody knows them. They do a crime and they go across the bridge and back home. Um, if we get the information about license plates, vehicles, and we put it out, all points bulletins and crime alerts, Oftentimes we, we find success with that. So that's kind of the strategy that we're taking. We're also working, you mentioned you're getting the budget and, and uh, analysts to look at our shootings for the last five years. We're, we're also in the process of doing that same exercise. Actually, we're at the end of our analysis. We went back three years and um, we're almost at the end of that review to really get a, um, more detailed set of facts about 
who our victims are, who our suspects are, what have been the trends over this last three years. And so we're almost at the end of that. So it will be interesting to compare that to the work that you require. I hope that you should show the same thing, but it'll be interesting to compare that. And we're working actually from that framework to model our strategies this coming year, because we do think we have to change the way we handle gun violence. I can tell you this uh, because we're, we're setting our priorities for 2021. The number one priority was reduction of gun violence. We just had that meeting earlier today. So when, when you hear us you know, for budget presentations and all, I mean, all crime reduction is important, but we can't have people getting shot randomly in the city. We just can't have it. Overall, we're a fairly safe city. I'll say this from a nationwide standpoint, I'm on calls monthly with the uh, nationwide big city chiefs we're faring pretty well compared to a lot of big cities, but that's still no solace if it's happening in your neighborhood. Right. So we, we have to get better at it. I think we are getting better. We, we do pretty good in, in arresting the people responsible, but there's always work to get better because there are a lot of guns out in the streets. If I can just add, I don't want to be too long with it here. One of the trends that we are seeing, which is very disturbing, is what we call ghost guns. These are guns that are, are not manufactured professionally manufactured by a gun manufacturer. You can buy the parts on the internet. They're basically untraceable. They don't have serial numbers and people are basically making their own guns. And we're seeing a lot of those and it's a big problem and it's a problem that goes beyond San Francisco. So that's something that we're really trying to wrap our arms around. We're working with the ATF, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, we're working with our federal partners on that. But it's, it's an interstate issue. And it's a big issue because it's putting more guns out there in the streets. It's a huge issue. And it has to come from the federal government too, in terms of what they're gonna do about ghost guns. And I just wanna to say too, you know, about gang violence that we mentioned, um, it, it, ha it does affect the entire city. And Northern Station doesn't cover just District 2, it covers uh, District 5, District 6, I think maybe four or five districts. I don't know, you can correct me, um, Captain, yet. but. You know, when there's gang gun violence in one part of the city and officers are deployed to another part of the city exactly. in District 2, um, what happens is, like you said, we're 265 officers short. We know we don't have enough. Um, that deployment to, to, for prevent, preventative measures for, you know, to prevent more gang gun violence leaves parts of District 2 um, uh, not covered. And I, I know that, and it's because of, um, not having enough officers, but I know that's happened on a few occasions. And um, I don't know, Captain Yep, if you want to speak to that briefly, we have a few other questions that I want to make sure we get to, but um, yeah. if you want to speak to that really quick. Yeah, well, first I want to say, uh, I'm going to totally agree that uh, Supervisor Stephanie takes this very seriously and she's holding me and the, count and the uh, officers at uh, Northern Station accountable. She wants to know about every incident uh, she puts together a, meet a meeting immediately. So uh, it is, uh, I agree with her and the chief. The chief has constantly said, this is the highest priority. So for every shooting, you will get a good response from Northern Station. What I mean from good response is that an immediate response um, from several officers, because uh, protection of life is why we're here. Uh, so uh, we should be held accountable for that. So I will also reinforce what the chief said. There is a citywide trend and we are not, uh, in this district immune from that. So I can tell you from, because we're so accountable to the supervisor um, that we you know, I've been looking at these trends and it seems that or anecdotally that the gun violence uh, in our district in the Northern does not originate from the Northern. It seems like uh, there are groups of criminals that are traveling through the district and there's gunfire and it is difficult to deal with because they are random meaning that there's no clear pattern that we can follow and put a fixed post out to watch out for this type of crime. But uh, the, the reason that I say I believe it's transitional or that it comes through the district is because in a few cases, we have a hard time finding the victim or the intended victim of the gunfire has not come forward. Because that generally gives us information about why the crime occurred and who the suspect is, but they seem to be fleeting incidents where cars are shooting at cars or someone from a car is shooting at a person. So that does make it very difficult for us. Um, and I would say in that case, and I agree with the supervisor that um, not only is there 
when we can't locate the victim of the intended gunfire, the neighborhood is certainly the victim. So we take it very seriously. And uh, the chief alluded to a meeting earlier and he and his command staff are working on, they've created a unit called the Gun Violence Reduction Unit um, that has been initiated. So what happens when we respond to those calls is we look for evidence and we look for witnesses and victims. So when we recover gun uh, casings or you know cartridge casings from the gunfire, uh, we take those as evidence and we submit them to this unit who actually does a lot of follow-up. And although if we don't find the suspect immediately, uh, I, you know, it's important that we go and do everything we can find video because it does lead to tying in those firearms with other crimes and it does turn into real leads for us. So um, once again, it's a partnership. Um, it's important. It will always be a priority and we will always keep you informed on what's going on. So thank you. Great, thank you. We had a few questions on um, the homeless issue in terms of the pandemic. We know that um, we've massively had to reduce our shelter capacity um, when the pandemic struck. We know that there are um, shelter in place hotels being used on uh, Lombard Street. And those questions come up all the time. Um, Francis from Cal Hollow asked, how many of these crimes are related to the housing of homeless in the Lombard? She said Union Street hotels, but I uh, just want to be very clear that are three hotels in District 2 and they're all on Lombard Street. Um, she's saying I'm seeing these crimes all along Lombard and in the Marina Cal Hollow neighborhood. And um, I don't know. And I have heard from you that, that a lot of the crimes aren't tied to the hotel. So if you can explain, um, touch on that question, because it comes up a lot. Yeah, so no, so definitely uh, the emails, the calls, um, communicating with your office, uh, those are definitely on our radar. Uh, we've actually even reached out to our local city attorney's office representative to see if there are some enforcement, code enforcement issues that um, can be, you know, you know uh, researched. So uh, we're looking at all angles. Uh, what's difficult is that uh, those hotels are private property and we have limited access to what we can do. But certainly in and around those areas, uh, we have, there have been reports of crime, there have been arrests made. Uh, witnesses have told us that they've seen um, suspicious persons and suspicious activity in those hotels. So what I can tell you is that it's, it's definitely on our radar. Uh, we will look for those connections. I can't definitively say that the crimes that are in and around the hotels are tied to the hotels, but certainly we are looking at that angle. And uh, certainly I've updated the officers at Northern Station with this information also. So uh, keep the information coming and please keep reporting that suspicious activity. And then we do have four homeless outreach officers at Northern Station. Uh, they have been very responsive. They do what they can. Um, I'm very proud of the work they do. Uh, when there is an enforcement action that we can take, they contact, for instance, the Healthy Streets Operations Center, or they contact our crisis intervention teams and try to lead with services. So uh, we see what you're seeing, and uh, we're doing what we can. So thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor, if I could just add and give uh, Captain Yep some credit. I, you know, I was on a meeting today about this very issue that we have in biweekly with the other city uh, partners, department heads, and uh, they gave Captain Yep and his team uh, a huge uh, kudos because it was described that the northern uh, officers were probably the most responsive station in the city when it came when it comes to this issue so I, just, I, 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 I have not had a chance to tell Paul that yet but uh, that, that that was a pretty high compliment that that's good that's good to hear I know I mean I love working with Captain Yep and um, so responsive to me and as he says I, I bother him a lot so um uh you know and the other thing too when um captain yep and i were talking to other neighbors about this very issue um we were learning that some of the behavior that um that was problematic um was coming from uh, other hotels that weren't used by the city and we had one question from i think it's binky from cal hollow about the greenwich hotel um, that there's been many police incidents there, gun fired, uh, drug, traffic, dra drug trafficking, um, and prostitution. This is their question. These two are likely linked. They said, we live a half block down from the hotel with our two young children. We, 
who are four and eight years old, we feel and evidently are unsafe in our neighborhood and what do you propose to change? And I think um, you touched on a little bit, Captain Yep, about looking at uh, with the city attorney's office, which we're doing together in terms of, is there any, um, is, is there anything that the hotels could be doing differently? Um, and I don't know if you want to add any more to that, because I think you're aware of that location has been somewhat problematic. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I really like these meetings is because uh, like issues like that get brought to my attention. So I can tell you that based on your question, I will focus some um, attention to that issue, um, that Greenwich Hotel with the supervisor's office and with our allied agencies. And we'll do an assessment of what's going on. And I will certainly report back to this community about what we find. And, uh, and I think I would just ask for a little time. Great, thank support. you. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much. The next question is about drug dealing from Andy in Cal Hollow. He says, on weekend nights, I witness drug dealing along Lombard Street. Dealers on scooters sell meth or fentanyl to the individuals living on the streets. What is being done to disrupt the drug trade on Lombard Street? And I would add um, for all, all streets, uh, you know, where this is occurring for that matter. Yeah, you know, uh, let me just say we, we have to do more. You know, we, we make a lot of arrests. I know the captains are paying attention. They, they deploy, we make arrests. Um, a lot of our, you know, narcotics unit resources are deployed in, in downtown in that Civic Center Tenderloin area just because of the challenges there, which is the hub of a lot of the drug dealing. But we have to do more, supervisor, and for the audience. Um, Drug dealing and overdoses are literally killing this city. I mean, I think the numbers now are over 570. This was as of, I think, a couple of weeks ago, overdose related deaths in this city this year. I mean, that's, you know, our homicides, we, we 45 homicides a year. It takes us 12 years to, to have that many homicides, but we've lost that many people to overdoses. And, you know, try to, you know, to make arrests is helpful. It's not solving the problem. Um, there are challenges right now, and this is this is just the reality. You know, I'm not going to make it into an excuse. It's the reality, and we got to figure out a way around it. And we got to figure out a way to deal with the, the the reality. But there are some significant challenges, even when we make arrests, and even when the district attorney files the cases. Because of COVID and early releases, you know, a lot of the, the individuals just aren't getting held uh, in, in jail. And, and I understand that because of COVID and a lot of people were, you know, getting sick and dying in prison and all that. I, I, I understand it. We just have to find a solution because we will continue to arrest. We will never stop doing that. That's our jobs. But we have to find a solution uh, around the board to, to deal with this problem. Uh, we're not dealing with it effectively on the, on the youth side. You know, we have a lot of people that are struggling with addiction. These crimes are now misdemeanors. They're not felonies. That, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing that, because that caused some other problems with jail overcrowding and the like. But what we're doing is not effective and we, we, we have to find a way to do better. And this is a discussion that has been uh, ongoing and a lot of time and energy. And I don't have the solution right now yet but I will tell you, I think the solution has got to go beyond the police department to everybody that has a stake in this, including clinicians to deal with the addiction, the jails to deal with what are, what's happening to people when they're in the jails. Are they being treated to where they have a chance to break that addiction cycle? The sellers who we are arresting, oftentimes, you know, they get numerous bites of the apple before they get any accountability in terms of jail time. And it's a, it's a challenge right now, but here's the one thing that I will tell you and guarantee you, we'll continue to do our jobs and we'll make arrests. We just have to find better solutions because we're, we're not nearly as effective as we need to be on this issue. Thank you for that. You know, I hear, we hear a lot, you know, the war on drugs um, does not work, you know, and then I think, well, what does, you know, tell it, figure out what does then. If it does, if the war on drugs doesn't work, what does? Because something has to work. And obviously it's not working with the amount of people that are overdosing and the crimes that result from people's drug use. It's just infuriating to me. And I'm holding actually a hearing on February 11th in the Public Safety Committee 
um, to talk about addiction and to talk about um, people who've recovered from addiction, um, drug use and alcoholism, people who have been down and out have been through the system and they're gonna tell us what worked for them. And um, I think it's a voice that's often unheard in this city. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from them because if we wanna learn anything, we gotta to learn to the people who you know, were arrested many times, who were in and out um, and who finally got clean and sober and have turned their lives around. We owe it to them to listen to them. And I think the only way we're gonna find out what does work if the war on drugs didn't and it doesn't, we better figure out what does. So um, I thank you for the work that you do and we'll keep um, on that subject, obviously. Um, I know that we're coming up on time, but we have a question around crime prevention. What do you recommend people do um, with their home or condo owners um, to protect their premises? And another uh, was how to be safe like out in the district. Um, I'm just summarizing these really quick because, and the other one was how do, can the elderly protect themselves? from dangerous situations uh, when going out for a walk in the daytime. And I actually had a conversation with the Heritage recently over there on Laguna and Bay um, about their fears of just being out in the day. Yeah, um, I'll start and I'm sure Paul and, and Bill probably would like to weigh in. Uh, uh, the first thing is, is pay attention to your surroundings. Um, we're so distract, you know, distracted these days with devices and phones and just you know the electronic gadgets that we that we have, have have incorporated into our lives that really take our attention away from just you know being aware of what's around us. I mean I can't tell you how many times you know and I do it myself sometimes. I'm so engrossed in what's on my phone with you know text message or email and I'm walking and I'm looking down and things are going on around me and I have to catch myself and put my head up and look around because I know better. But oftentimes, you know, we, we see that people are distracted and then their purses get snatched, their phones get snatched, their, you know, jewelry gets snatched or they get robbed. And, and not to say that you can always prevent that. I'm not, you know, that, that's insulting because sometimes there's nothing you can do. But sometimes you can, particularly if you see it coming. And, you know, we shouldn't have to live our lives in fear, you know, where we, we, we can't walk down the street without being in fear of being robbed or assaulted, but at least take an assessment of, you know, of what's around you. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing is if you are, uh, if there's no need to carry like large sums of money around or that type of thing, don't, don't. I mean, we're kind of a plastic society right now. You know, you can almost do everything from your phone these days, including spend money. So the advice that we would give is Take advantage of that because oftentimes, you know, when people rob somebody or steal from somebody and they and they get a big score, it's like a drug, you know, and then they're, they're looking for more. And, and we've had robberies for whatever reason. And people should let me let me preface this by saying, you know, in this country, people should be able to do whatever they want to do. If they want to walk around with five thousand dollars in their pocket, they should be able to do it. But unfortunately, some of the bad people know that people are walking around with $5,000 in their pocket and they're getting robbed. And you would, you know, you might ask yourself, what's the need for that? You might be making a business transaction or what, what have you, but if you can avoid doing that, don't do it, you know. Um, with your homes, basic, lock your doors, lock your windows, when you, particularly when you're not at home. If you have a surveillance or camera system, make sure it's operational and make sure that you check the system from time to time. And if, if you happen to capture something that might be a crime on there, please let us know. And I would ask for your cooperation that we that evidence be shared with us. I can't tell you how many crimes we saw because of good people who have camera systems because we can't, this city has an ordinance, the police department cannot operate cameras. Uh, but you can't, and that's what we rely on. So if you have a business or and you have a camera system or home, please share that information if you capture a crime, because that's how we solve a lot of the crimes in our city. Um, shrubberies and things like that to block the view and obscure. Keep those things trimmed, neat. You know, this is basic stuff, but keep them trimmed, neat. Make sure that you don't create 
hiding places for people to lurk around and, and break into your house or lurk around and attack you when you come out of your house. Uh, look at your surroundings when you're pulling into your driveway or your, your garage. You know, we've had these follow homes and things like that. Don't answer the door if you don't know who's on the other side. You can talk through the door, who is it? If you don't like what you're hearing, don't answer the door. If it really sounds disturbing, call the police. We will come, we won't be mad at you. Um, protect your identity. You know, we, we, and we're talking about street crimes and violent crimes. We hadn't said a lot tonight about identity theft, which is a huge problem in this city and in this country right now. Protect your identity. Don't make it easy to have your mail stolen. You know, take precautions. For those of you that have a P.O. box, use it because you're going to protect yourself that way. Uh, if you have a lock on your mailbox, use it. But don't make yourself easy for identity theft. Watch, cover your PIN number when you're, you know, using it and things like that. Because those crimes are really, really hard to solve. And they are devastating. So I, I, would, I would put an emphasis on that, particularly around this time of year. You know, you shouldn't be giving anybody that you don't know your social security, your credit card numbers or any of that. You know, you may not believe this, some of you, but people get defrauded all the time over scams that you say, why would somebody fall for that? But there are a lot of smooth scam artists out there and a lot of it is done over the phone or you make a transaction at a trusted store and your identity or your credit card numbers get stolen. So make sure you're, you're in tune with that. Um, I just have advice, you know, a lot of people pay for gas. I go to Costco, I pay for gas at the, cause you have to at Costco, but be careful when you use those type of um, gas station, pay at the pump type of devices because some of them are cloned. And if they look funny, if they look like they've been tampered with, Go inside the station and pay for your your whatever you're buying. Don't use it because we've seen a lot of victims that way. So I can go on and on, but I'll stop there because I know Paul might want to add some things as well. Thanks, Chief. I'm going to double down on what you said for sure. So for the home, um, I'm a big believer in lighting and video surveillance cameras. Uh, to me, and I don't own any stock in any video camera company, so I'll just tell you that up front. But I'm a big believer because I want you to share that evidence with us. I can tell you there's countless cases that were solved because we got the video. To me, it's a force multiplier. If we can't be there to witness it, if you give us the video, it'll give us so much information. And at least we look at trends and patterns and where these people, the criminals have gone. So big believer in that. And then be a good neighbor. Look out for your neighbors. I mean, in this time when we're home and uh, forced to be home to a large extent, Look out for your neighbors, communicate with each other. And if you think something is suspicious, contact each other. And if you feel it's necessary, contact the police if you're not sure. So please do that. And as far as safety on the street, uh, I'm also gonna agree with the chief that um, I call it being proactive about your safety. But when you walk around, uh, I make it a habit of looking at everything and everybody. And when something moves or changes, I look at it. Uh, I'm a true believer just from working the streets that if I just glance, I, like I don't challenge people. But I'll glance at people just to acknowledge that I've seen them. And I think even a simple thing like that can deter uh, that suspect from making you the victim. Because I do believe that a lot of suspects are looking for the element of surprise. And if, if they think you've seen them or the car, they might move on to the next person. So um, just be very wary. Um, do your best to be safe. Travel with people. Travel where light is. And uh, and I think the chief great, gave some great tips and I, I just totally agree with those. And I just, uh, I, I repeated them, but I think they're worth repeating. So thank you, chief. Great. Thank you so much. And I have, I just, I know we're running on time. I have three more questions that I really want to um, ask you in terms of small businesses. We know our small businesses are suffering so badly. I think before we, um, before we even started, we were talking about another business that's been hit so many times. Um, and they mentioned foot patrols. We kind of talked about that um, earlier, but what it keeps coming up, and I want to make sure this question gets asked from Rachel um, from Golden Gate Valley is, what can the police do to stop the constant thefts at our Walgreens stores? Um, what advice do the police have about the situation? How can the situation be fixed so that shoplifting cannot continue on a daily basis um, with no retail clerks feeling safe enough um, to take on the shoplifters? And you know, I talk to my Walgreens um, all the time at Division Lombard, and 
you know, um, they don't feel safe. The clerks don't feel safe. I've known them forever. And uh, we just, uh, that the Walgreens, obviously you've seen the videos and everything of um, things just being put into a bag and taken out. So people wanna know what's going on and what advice do you have and what can be done? Yeah, uh, yes, thank you for that question because we just met with Wal Walgreens executives from uh, the West Coast region yesterday. And this has been ongoing in terms of us working with that team of executives from Walgreens to try to try to, to help with this problem. Now, one of the, uh, there were several takeaways. I, I can give some examples of uh, successful partnerships with Walgreens. Uh, there's a store, a Walgreens store in the Bayview on Williams. And it was actually, they were in the process of about to close the store because their shrinkage rate and their loss rate was off the charts. And they had already closed the, the Walgreens in the Bayview on Third Street. So that would have left the community without a Walgreens. So long story less long, um, that's when we really started to really engage with the Walgreens management team. And this was last, last year. And so we put together a plan. And you know, part of that plan was they had to do some things on their end. Now that particular store had a very not so good security with the private security company um, because of just the, there was very low morale at the store. The, the, the clerks were not in, as engaged as they should be. Paul, uh, Captain Yep just mentioned, a simple thing like eye contact when people walk in the store, just so they know that the clerk see who they are. None of that was being done. You walk in the store and uh, the captain of Bayview actually did this. He, he went in one day in plain clothes and he walked around there, he said, for probably 20, 30 minutes, nobody even looked at him. And those type of things matter. So we met with them and we kind of told our side of what we were seeing and what we could use some help on for, for them to do what they needed to do in the store. And then what we did on the public side is we posted uh, what we call a decoy car in front of the store, uh, random times, but it was there consistently. They actually hired a 10B officer, an uh, off-duty uniform San Francisco Police Department officer. We started doing community programming at that store in conjunction, you know, in collaboration with uh, Joaquin's uh, Economic and Workforce Development Office. Community programming, you know, food giveaways and the like. I don't think it was food giveaway, but that kind of thing. But to bring some life to that, to that corner in that parking lot, it turned around. They decided to keep the store this early this year. They signed a five-year lease. So I think that was a success story. Similar in the Ingle side where they were getting hit all the time on, on Geneva. And similar type of partnership, passing calls, more engagement by police officers. Both stores, we had the officers make it a point to stop by the store during the shifts in between calls or when they were coming back to the station in Bayview's case, and just walk in and say hi. Or just walk around the store and then leave. You know, in that type of consistent presence, we were able to do that and it made a difference. We did the same thing in Ingleside uh, on Geneva. So those are the type of things that we're trying to do while we look at larger, uh, bigger picture uh, things or solutions. There is a statewide retail theft task force. And the reason I say that is they have been effective. We're part of it. It's, uh, it's, it's headed by the CHP, the governor, gave funding for another Northern California task force and the Southern California. We're part of course of Northern California. They've been very successful in terms of making some really, really big arrests in terms of these fencing operations that are buying all this stolen property from Walgreens. Here's the thing that I learned on the call yesterday. Online retailers like Amazon or you know middlemen like Amazon and the like are contributing significantly to the problem because there's no regulation, there's no checks and balances. And if you buy those type of items, chances are they probably are stolen. So there was an operation just a couple of months ago uh, where they end up raiding a, a, a wall, I mean, an Amazon warehouse, $8 million worth of merchandise, $8 million worth of merchandise. And you know, most people, when they go on Amazon, they, they don't think about the stuff may be stolen because you're buying, you know, stuff that you can buy over the counter, but it's more convenient, particularly in the COVID era. But the advice is some of the, uh, my understanding is some of these online retailers that these middle men, 
have more stringent protocols in terms of trying to not add to the theft problem. So uh, that I just learned about this yesterday when we were meeting with Walgreens and they said that's probably the biggest problem they face. So they're pushing legislation to, to have some regulation with these companies because they're adding to the problem. And the end of the day, it costs you and me more as consumers because of all this theft. So that's part of the issue. And the other thing is uh, we would like for this retail theft task force that the governor has funded to be refunded. The funding stops at the end of this fiscal year, which would be in the middle of the year of July. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have a voice with your local uh, state legislature, you may want to mention supporting that uh, through the state because it really has been a, a, a key to us trying to push some of this retail theft back because we're going to lose our stores if we don't get a handle on this. That's right. Thank you for that. And Captain Yep, I just want to say we need more attention at the Walgreens at Divis and Lombard. Um, it's, you know, I, I call it in a lot, but we need to maybe do some type of um, program that Chief Scott just mentioned because it's, it's bad. Um, on process, uh, people, and you hear this all the time again, um, people don't want to call the police anymore because they don't think there's anything they can or will do. Um, was, they said one person, I think Lisa from Cow Hollow mentioned an incident and said when the officer finally arrived, he was visibly frustrated and said, this is just the way it is now. Um, and one other question um, from Max from Pacific Heights. He says, I've heard that police ignore certain kinds of crimes because it is alleged the DA won't prosecute them. Is this true or not true? Realizing the question is sensitive, I would appreciate a direct, candid answer nevertheless. And, and a reminder, we're going to meet with the DA as well, but that's something that is said. And um, obviously this person understands it's a sensitive question, but um, would like you to discuss what we hear all the time anecdotally that that police officers are frustrated and all of that. Yeah, so I, as a broad categorical statement that the DA doesn't prosecute, that's not true, okay? What I will say is there are things that we wish that there would be more aggressive prosecution on. There are, are, are areas where we are working with the DA uh, on making sure as much as we can do that that we get some traction on, on prosecutions. But that broad statement that the DA doesn't prosecute crimes, that, that's just not, that's not true at all. Um, there are some frustrations, you know, I just mentioned um, you know, property crime. And it's not so much of prosecution because some of them are getting prosecuted, not all. Uh, we like to see more, but it goes beyond that. It's what happens when they get prosecuted. It is one thing to prosecute, but if the person is, you know, right now, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this is an altogether bad thing, there's basically no bail. Now, what that, I mean, there, there's some good benefits to that, in my opinion, but there's no bail. So, person who is victimizing a community, they get arrested. If they're not a violent crime threat, and there's a, there's a whole process for this. There's a, a safety assessment that's done by the sheriff's office and it's determined whether or not, ultimately it's the court's decision, but it's determined whether or not that person needs to be uh, incarcerated until they, until they have their, their day in court. The majority of people, unless it's a serious violent crime, are not gonna be held in jail. Now COVID is adding to that, but it's a, it's a much bigger issue than just, you know, what the percentage of cases that are being prosecuted or not, because even the ones that are being prosecuted, we're seeing people who get arrested and the case is actually filed. And because they're let out uh, of jail, they're reoffending while they're waiting on their court date. So it, it is a much, and, and supervisor, you were a prosecutor, you know how, how complicated this is and how many moving parts. Um, the bottom line is we have to work with the DA we have to work together with the DA because this, this whole thing is dysfunctional if we don't. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I think there's areas where we have common ground. There's areas where there needs to be more collaboration, better improvement. Ultimately, the DA makes the charging decisions. Our job is to give that DA the best evidence that we can give them. So if the decision is made not to prosecute, you know, at least we've given them the evidence and then we can have that argument. 
great. Thank you for that. You, you make a very good point that, you know, I was a prosecutor before and uh, there's many systems that need to work together um, for the benefit of all. And that's you know, the police department, the DA's office, the courts, and um, it is complicated, but um, it has to be done. If you're in law enforcement, you know, um, and you want to keep people safe, you need to work with all the others that also want to do the same thing. Um, one last question, because um, this has come up a lot in terms of the calls that the police um, might not be going to anymore, um, the new street crisis response team. Um, someone asked if there is a separate number to call to engage the city's new street crisis response team, and should we phone them when, for example, someone is sleeping on a mattress on Sacramento Street? Can you just give a little bit of information on that? Um, because I don't think everyone um, knows exactly how that's working with your department. Sure, thank you. And that's, that, thank you for that question, uh, who, whoever asked it, because the first thing is we wanna, as a city, we wanna make this the, the least amount, uh, the least complicated as possible. Uh, so no, you call the same number. Uh, you can call the non-emergency police number, or you can do it through 311, uh, uh, but you call the same number. It's the same system, same number. What happens is once you call that number, the Department of Emergency Management will triage that call and they'll decide whether to dispatch the street crisis response team, SCRT. Now, this is at the very beginning stages and it's a pilot that's very small. Their, own, their, their, their capacity right now is about eight to 12 calls a day and their, their area of focus is the Tenderloin area. That's gonna be expanded. It, it gets suspended, I think, the first expansion is next month, I believe. We're in December next month, and then it gets expanded even bigger uh, later in the spring. But still, even when it gets expanded, we're there's over twenty thousand calls a year that we believe that fit in that category: nonviolent, non-criminal cases, mental health crisis, guy or woman on the ground, you know, some type of substance issue. There's a lot of calls out there, and those are the ones that this team will respond to. If there's a violent crime involved or crime period or a weapon that somebody's using in a violent manner or threatening to use, or there's enough information to believe that that person is gonna commit a violent act, that call will still go to the police department when this is all said and done. So, so far, uh, I just got the numbers yesterday and it was only for the first uh, 10 days. We started, we stood it up on uh, November 30th. We're now what, 18 days into this. Uh, they've handled less than 50 calls in total. Um, but the calls that they've handled, they've been successful. There's really good teamwork. It's the fire department, it's uh, public health, it's uh, 360 Health, right? I think is the, is the nonprofit. And so you got a community-based organization and they're handling these calls where it's really not appropriate or necessary for a police response. It has a lot of promise. I think we all are excited about it because it will hopefully free our offices up to respond to these other things that we've been talking about all, on this call tonight. So just, uh, we would ask to support it. You know, we got to work out a lot of kinks, but call the same number you're calling now and then the city does the work from there. Great, thank you so much, Chief. And that question was from uh, Kirk from Pacific Heights. And I also um, want to mention, if you don't know, the non-emergency police number is 553 zero one two three and that's what you use um if, if it's not a 911 call um but you you can also call 311 but the non-emergency police line five five three zero one two three so i want to thank everybody um, for coming tonight for all those who submitted questions chief scott thank you so much for your time and for all that you do thank you captain yep i love working with you we'll continue to obviously thank you for being here tonight I think Captain Conley had to leave, but I'm enjoying working with him in the Richmond area. District 2 only has a little bit of the Richmond station, but he's been, there actually has been a lot of things going on there, but he's been great to work with as well. Um, this was recorded and we will be circulating the video. So um, if anyone wants to go back and look at what we said, you can. Also, if a question is outstanding, let us know. We will definitely reply. And I just want everyone to know that this is a huge priority of mine, how to keep people in District 2 safe um, and how to work with all of our law enforcement agencies to do that. 
is something I will never stop thinking about and never stop working on. So again, I wanna thank Chief Scott and Captain Yep and all the officers um, for, for doing what you do. It, it matters and um, we thank you, we're grateful. So everyone have a good night, happy holidays. And Thank I don't you. want to say one last thing. Yeah, I just want to say one thing, if you would allow me to. Of uh, course. First, first, happy holidays. But I just want to say this. This has been in, in policing probably, I, this, I have now 31 years in this profession. This has probably been the most challenging year in my 31 years. With everything that's happened this year between COVID and, and the unrest of the, you know, after the Floyd incident. And now, you know, we're having, you know, issues with, you know, what we're having in the city with, officers being charged and, and, and whatnot. And I'll, I'll say, look, we welcome accountability. We, we do, we welcome it. We don't want any of our officers doing anything uh, that's unjust, unfair, un unlawful. We welcome that. But it's a tough time right now for, for our officers and all that, that I would ask, hold us accountable, hold us to the standard that you expect, but we also need your support. You know, if you see your, your community officer, your, your beat officer, just tell them thanks or tell them you, you, you support them every, or her every now and then, because that really means a lot. I'm headed to a lineup in about an hour. And, you know, as the chief of this department, you know, my message is I've been through ups and downs before, many of them. It's been more intense this year than I think I've ever seen with the ups and downs. But for the officers that have to do this job every day, you know, sometimes they just need to hear that, and we know, we know that most people do support us, but they don't hear it very often. So I would ask, this is an ask from your chief, hold us accountable, hold those standards high, but please you know, tell the officers when you see them out in the street, just if they've done a good job, tell them. That would be very, very helpful. And it goes so far, it goes a really long way. So happy holidays to everybody and thank you all for having us on. Thank you, Chief. I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's very important in your comment the other day about balance. I think that that's just so important. So thank you for ending on that note. Again, thank you, Captain Yep. And thank you, everyone. Have a very happy holiday season. Stay safe and contact our office if you need anything or have any other questions. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays.